Okay, let's go ahead and get this thing started. This is Ken Perry from Pied Piper. He's uh, helped me out immensely. He's taught me a lot. Um, hopefully, he can answer all of your questions and everybody's questions that is here and with the OWL program. With that, Ken, I'm going to turn it over. Okay. Very pleased to meet you all. By way of introduction, I was born and raised in Fairbanks back in the territorial days. We won't get into how old I am. I am the owner of uh, Pied Piper Pest Control, the state's oldest pest control company. And uh, we have been on the forefront in quite a bit of this issue with bed bugs. And so because of that, we've worked very hard to increase our knowledge and share it with people as best we can. And if this gives me extra credit points, I was in the library club in Lathrop High School for four years. <laughs> I knew Dewey Decimal before, well, never mind. <laughs> so what we're going to talk about a little bit today is just a basic overview of bed bugs and the bed bug problem here in Alaska, and especially here in Anchorage, although it is a problem throughout the state. We'll talk a little bit about some of the basics, the rise in the issue, a little bit about uh, the workplace, since the workplace is becoming more and more of a concern. And we'll try to spend as much time as possible on the library situation because that is the gist of what we want to help you with today, is working in the library setting and the propensity of you getting a bed bug issue from time to time. Please feel free to ask questions at any time, although we will have an opportunity at the end for questions as well, whether they're on the topic we discuss or anything having to do with bed bugs, bugs, rats, mice, pesky wise. Husbands, excuse me. I think I'm outnumbered here today. Okay, so bed bugs, uh, scientifically, uh, that uh, species is uh, Cymex lectularius. That means common bed bug. And by common, that simply means it's the most common one seen in the world. And it is the one that is the most common invader as far as coming into people's homes, uh, tents, and so forth like that. We have other, two other species of bed bug here in Alaska that we've identified. Uh, they're actually a relative of the bed bug. We have the bat bug, which is in the same Cymex family, and it is a uh, host specific to the bats that we have. So what will happen is if you have bats in your attic, when they leave, if they happen to be carrying that particular bug, those bugs will come down looking for something else to feed on, and they will cross-feed into the human train, although that's not their, their preferred uh, food. We also have the swallow bug, which I had the privilege of discovering myself about uh, 30 years ago up in the Gulfstream Valley of Fairbanks. This, too, is host specific to the swallow. It's actually a level above the bed bug and the bat bug. It's not in the same uh, genus, but it is in the same family. And the uh, swallow bug is traveling on our swallows, the ones that build the mud nests. And once again, when the birds begin to get very active in the fall, the babies start flying. They're not as easy to feed on. They'll come down. Or when they leave to migrate out for the wintertime, then they'll come down. Sometimes they won't come down until the following spring because they uh, fell asleep, or went to sleep in the cold up there and don't wake up until it warms up. But those two show themselves from time to time here in Alaska, and so one needs to be careful and ask the right questions to know which species they're dealing with, although they are killed in somewhat similar ways. The ease of killing bat bugs and swallow bugs is nice, and the targeting is different than it is with a common uh, uh, Semexa lectularius. In the mid-2000s, in the mid-early 2000s, I should say, about 2000-2005, the East Coast began to see an increase in the number of jobs they were doing for bed bugs. Naturally, it came first in the hotel area, the travel industry. They noticed it increasing a little bit, but then they also saw it coming up in homes and especially in um, uh, elderly housing on the East Coast, which there are huge numbers of those types of buildings out there. There was an entomologist who I have known for about 30 years, who was telling us when we'd meet from time to time for special meetings 
that it was going to be a problem, and we all thought that he didn't know what he was talking about. His name was Philip Cooper, and Phil was right, unfortunately. It hit hard by the middle of 2000s. By 2008, it was an epidemic. Uh, Alaska lagged behind just a couple of years on that epidemic issue. Uh, we started seeing an increase in our numbers. We always had had bed bugs from time to time, once a year, twice a year, maybe a year without them. Almost always in the travel industry, we would deal with bed bugs. And of course, we dealt with bat and swallow bugs from time to time as well. But we began to see an increase here, at least in our company, uh, in about uh, 2008. From 2005, or excuse me, 2000 to 2005, we saw just a modest increase. By 2008, we had seen a 200% increase in bed bug jobs. By 2010, no, by 2012, the numbers were up by 500%, and by 2014, they were up 1,000% from the initial, yes. Is the increase attributed, I read this somewhere several years ago, to uh, the cessation of using DDT? There are a lot of opinions circulating among the specialists and the research scientists on that matter. Certainly, it does have something to do with changes in pesticides, whether it's the actual loss of DDT or the loss of certain application methods. For many years in our industry, the th concept was spray and leave. So we would go into people's homes, we'd spray all along the baseboards, the hotels, we'd spray all along the baseboards, and you stood a good chance of getting several bed bugs as you're going along. Well, then we began to see the need to change our approach to a more IPM, uh, integrated pest management approach. And we stopped doing that type of chemical spray because it was just a, an unnecessary use of chemicals. Uh, and although we're not afraid of pesticides, we are careful about the use of pesticides. So especially for us, we saw that happen. Uh, and that seemed to be industry-wide, we saw a same mix. How much that contributed is hard to say. Other ideas that have come up have to do with the vast change in transportation, people getting faster from lands that had bed bugs to lands that did not. That has some merit, but again, the question arises, why all of a sudden in 2000 would you see this? When we've had faster travel since the late, 19, uh, late, uh, <laughs> late 1990s, maybe, maybe not. Other things have to do with the huge influx of uh, newer peoples to our country. Uh, people coming from countries where bed bugs were very common did not know that they didn't have to live with them. And so when they had them, they just grew. And add to that the tremendous number of people now living in multifamily dwellings. Huge numbers of people who are living thin wall to thin wall with each other. And again, because they don't treat, they spread from unit to unit. Here in Anchorage, we've seen that as being a, a big contributor. For years, we saw it in the cockroach business. Uh, in the cockroach business, we would see that certain uh, individuals from certain uh, countries would have a higher incidence of cockroach problems. Many of them were refugees. They lived in places where if you complained, you get kicked out or maybe shot. And so they would never tell the landlord until it spread throughout the whole complex. That seems to be similar in the bed bug problem here in Anchorage, our large number. The second is that we have a large number of landlords here who unfortunately are not proactive. They don't care. And they're letting the problems get out of hand. Now, I have been in consultation with the municipality. We are working on a new tenant landlord law, which is going to help a little bit in that regard. Hopefully that will go through in the next month or so and help to get some relief to the people who are dealing with bed bugs without the help of their landlords. Uh, and that's a little different um, issue. If you want to talk about it later, we can, or uh, you can email me and we'll discuss it more. Or you can email uh, the assembly. They can tell you about that new regulation, how it's going. But you are right. The, there's a lot of consternation as to why. The use of stronger chemicals now to less, maybe. The loss of the organophosphates uh, in favor of the uh, synthetic pyrethroids, yes. Uh, we have seen that there is a much faster resistance in the bed bug populations in um, large areas, large metropolitan areas, 
to the synthetic pyrethroids. That might indicate that the change in pesticides has something to do with it. We've seen that a little bit here in Alaska, not hugely, but a little bit of resistance to that. So it's important if you're dealing with bed bugs that you consider carefully what you're using and how you're using it. Um, and we can talk about that just a little bit later too because there may be some thoughts about how do we deal with it. Now as far as the workplace is concerned, we lagged behind the U.S. again there. You started hearing these stories of these uh, stores closing down because somebody found a bed bug uh, in the uh, linen department or something like that. Uh, or a lawyer's office, this one really hurt, hurt me, a lawyer's office who sent a woman home from her job because she had bed bugs at home and she brought one in and so a lawyer of all things sent her home said she couldn't work again so the problem's taken care of. Drastic overkill. Um, and so we see that from time to time. I actually prepared a document, the document that you have there that says uh, um, help my employee has bed bugs at home. Uh, I dealt, I, I have so many clients that have faced that, that I prepared that document for them to help them to see that it's not a panic situation. Many times in a business environment, bed bugs can be introduced and you would never know what happened. Because there are no sleeping arrangements there, their food availability is very small. The only thing bed bugs can feed on is human blood, feed or drink. There's nothing else they can feed on. Animal blood, so forth like that, they're not interested in, only human blood. And so because of that, people that are working at their desk are usually moving. And because bed bugs, bed bugs like you still, they generally will not go after you when you're moving. Now, if you're like some employees, which we don't talk about, who don't move much, might be a different matter. <laughs> you know who they are, and I know you deal with them kindly. But in, in seriousness, uh, usually those bed bugs simply wander away. They may get killed by a spider. They may die naturally. A bed bug can go for up to a year without feeding. But other uh, circumstances can also cause their early demise. Do they have kind of an indefinite? Uh, generally, their lifespan is only a couple of years. Yeah, they will die naturally anyway, and so that's why too you just never know, you know, what's going to happen with that one or two bed bugs. And usually, with an introduction, especially in a business environment, uh, it's usually an introduction of one or two. And if you find that one or two and kill them, then the thing to do is wait and see what happens, because doing anything more than that would be an unnecessary expense, and if you're thinking of using pesticides, an unnecessary use of pesticides. So we say wait and see, monitor the situation, and then make a decision as you want, you want to do. Now in your situation, here, those uh, in the library business, you're hit twofold. One, you've got the bed bugs that are walking in the front door with uh, many of our clientele who have bed bugs in their homes or camps, they come in and they sit in their comfortable chairs. In some cases, that's the only reason they come and sit in, in the library is to sit in their comfortable chairs. But maybe they come to read, or maybe they're bringing their children in, and they happen to carry a couple of bed bugs in. That bed bug gets found. Bill has trained his staff extremely well to watch for these incidences and not to panic. The last time I spoke here was, what, about two years ago? Yeah, and we had had an incident and we addressed everybody and, you know, calmed them down. What you want to avoid, and it's very important, is this concept that we have to tell everybody when a bed bug is found. Um, that tends to spread unnecessary panic. We have seen certain search situations, I'm not so sure about the library, but certainly in the hotel industry, people who start saying there are bed bugs here or bed bugs there, start giving the place a bad name when there's really no t reason to. It could be there were no bed bugs, but even if there were, it may have been taken care of. So rather than panic and start spreading stories, we want to be good fellow humans and not cause unnecessary damage to our employer, to our fellow employees, to the hotel industry who has taken care of us for a very nice wage when we stay in their hotels. So there's no sense in getting all out of line there. Of course, the second introduction 
And that is something that's come up recently. We kind of were watching for it, was the introduction of bed bugs to return books. And we have had that happen. Am I allowed to say anything about that? About what and where? Just a... I don't have a problem with it. Okay, because we're not just filming for the... Okay, in, in one of our outlying, um, in one of our branch libraries here in the municipality, someone returned some books. Fortunately, the staff caught the books and saw the damage. Unfortunately, somebody had already checked one out, and she took it home. She found the bed bugs, quickly returned it to the library, and we're now monitoring her home to make sure that she's okay. Um, and so that is something that's somewhat, somewhat new. Now, the books, I don't have the actual books in question, but this is one that was presented to me uh, as a potential bed bug threat. You can find them either in the cover where they've been smashed, and it may just look like uh, a little bit of uh, uh, chocolate or something off somebody's fingers, maybe red if it was a fully engorged bed bug. It may not even look like a bed bug if it's been smashed and, 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 and pushed around a little bit. But usually the easiest place to find them still alive is in the fold. And that's where on those books I found the live ones that were presented to me. Up inside this fold, and interestingly, not only underneath the fold where it comes over the um, page, but up inside the fold itself of the paper. They were up in there. You see, bed bugs like tight spaces to hide in. And so any place that's tight, they feel safe and secure, especially things that are not moving. And so because of that, a book laying on the bed or next to the bed can be a great place for a bed bug to hide until he's ready to feed again. Now, they generally feed on what we call a weekly basis, five to eight days, somewhere in there is the most common. There are some that will feed every day under some circumstances. We're finding out a little bit more about that, and I look to find out more at the next. We actually have a summit we go to every year, put on by uh, scientists on the East Coast <laughs> about bed bugs, and we're hoping to find out more because of the last summit, uh, they were talking about how, and this gentleman was from uh, England, they found the feeding was not necessarily on that four to eight day schedule. Some fed just a little bit every day, which is a little bit different. One thing they found was that some of the research, really all the research that they're doing on bed bugs in the university system is based on bed bugs that they're keeping and maintaining. And although you can extrapolate a lot of material from that, the scenario in which they're living is completely different than one that's living in a house. And so whereas these that are fed on a regular basis to keep them alive, and these that have to search for food and may be in fear of not having food may feed more frequently than these who know that Papa Scientist is going to come feed them in a couple of days. And so we're having to adjust our thinking a little bit in that regard. Another thing we found out at the last summit, and I'm veering off topic here a little bit, but it's so interesting, one of the big things that came to the forefront in the bed bug fight was the use of diatomaceous earth, commonly referred to as DE. Uh, DE, or diatomaceous earth, is a desiccant. In other words, it causes them to dry out their exoskeleton and extremely microscopic cutting agent that will cut their exoskeleton. It's been used in, in uh, insect control for many years uh, for different types of insect control. Unfortunately, and this came out last time, the bed bug's feet are different. They don't have pads. They have what are called tarsals. So they have a finely pointed finger, if you will, that they walk on. Because of that, they can walk through DE and not pick enough up to do them much damage because it doesn't necessarily stick to them. And so because of that, DE is now not the recommended product as a desiccant. <coughs> There are new desiccants that are showing much better um, ability to handle bed bugs. Uh, I tell people this, however, when it comes to questions of uh, controlling bed bugs, if you have something, use it. Anything is better than nothing. Uh, DE will kill bed bugs. It's not impossible. 
uh, especially if you puff it into an area where a bunch of them are, then it's going to get on their skin and they're going to die. So use what tools you have at your, at your disposal to deal with it. Why is there such a stigma about bed bugs since they don't carry diseases? I know. I tell everybody all they are is mosquitoes without wings. They really are. They, they, yeah, they don't transmit diseases. In fact, mosquitoes, except here in Alaska, have a much stronger ability to transmit disease than bed bugs do. But people tend to hear what they want to hear. And people who are making money off this industry, and I won't deny I'm making money off this, industry, off this situation, people who want to make it at all costs will spread things like that. And so I've seen that even among certain people that I was very surprised about uh, in the, in the uh, worldwide industry, not so much here. And so, yes, it's, I think it's the creep factor. You can hear a mosquito coming and you can slap it. A bed bug, you never know it was there. Uh, mosquitoes don't live in your, uh, in your bed. Um, bed bugs do. <laughs> so it just, this is the way people are, yes. When you're bit by uh, a bed bug and you get uh, the red bumps and stuff, how long does that last on you? The interesting thing about that is the experience that, you, that we call bed bug bites is different for every individual. Just like mosquito bites are different for every individual. You've probably known people who have been sucked on by a mosquito and never reacted. Uh, I, in, growing up in Fairbanks, I didn't respond much to mosquito bites because it was just, you know, you're just used to them, your skin got used to them. What really happens is what they tend to call a bite is really not a bite because what it is is it's a little hole where the mosquito, or in this case the bed bug, pushes their proboscis in to start their sucking. And the skin reacts to that intrusion. And the skin creates that little postule. And so that little postule is a decision as to how big it'll get, if it will be there at all, of your individual makeup. So you can, when you scratch it, it then it'll get worse. worse. Yeah, just like with a mosquito bite. There's nothing in the bed bug uh, saliva or anything that causes any kind of reaction like that. Okay. It's strictly the skin. You had a question? I thought, okay. Yes, ma'am. So when a patron has a reaction like that, is it, should we be looking for scratching? Should we be looking at all for anything like that? The situation is that some are of the opinion that we can deduce bed bugs based on the bites. Unfortunately, that's not true. As I said, because of the large number of things the skin will react to, you have to back it up by proof of bed bugs. One of the biggest problems I run into, and it chagrins me, is doctors who will tell a client, oh, those are bed bug bites, you need to call a professional and get your house treated, when it's not bed bug bites. We used to deal with this for some years with uh, spiders. People would be convinced they had spider bites. We tried to explain to them, no, spiders very seldom bite, and certainly not going to get a whole bunch of bites. Well, what is it? And I say, I can tell you what it isn't. I can't tell you what it is. Well, here's what I can tell you. Because the skin is a huge organ that covers your whole body, it reacts to anything that touches your body. And if it doesn't like it, it's going to react. And so one of the problems we have here in Alaska, in the wintertime especially, is our extremely dry air. Now, consider the difference between dry air and humid air. Things that are suspended in the air that you can never see, microscopic items, in a denser or wetter environment, they're surrounded by water molecules, they fall to the ground, and so they never touch the body. In a drier environment, they stay suspended much longer. So their opportunity to land on human skin is sufficiently uh, multiplied to where you have a much larger percentage of a chance for something to go on your skin that it doesn't like and then the skin says, I don't like that, and it raises a postule. The only way to tell if it's a puncture or not is with a very, very good microscope, even better than some of the doctor's offices have, because you have to see on such a microscopic level that puncture, puncture hole, and even then, it's possible the skin has already closed the hole. So, so you can't tell. And the same thing is applied to bed bug bites. I get calls from all over the states. And during some of the 
it just seems like it's going on all the time, but sometimes I will get five or six calls a day from areas such as rural areas or even here in Anchorage or our branches in, in other locations. And I always tell them, you've got to find the bites. Well, I got bites all over my body. I say, okay, if you have bites all over your body, you have a whole lot of bed bugs. Bed bugs are easier to find the day or two after they fed because they're bloated and they're red to dark brown, much easier to find. Lots of bed bugs are easier to find because they come to your eye carefully. Well, I thought they were invisible. No, they're really not. Even the tiniest of bed bugs, the newly hatched bed bug, can be seen if you're looking for it. Um, you have to have eyes that, that can see, and so that may be a challenge for some, but a hand lens can often make the difference. So um, if you can't find bed bugs and you're having that many bites, it's got to be something else. I have many people, well, I won't say many, but several people who come to me bringing me in all kinds of samples where I know it's in their head. Uh, and I try to be as kind. I will take the time to look at the samples, even though I know I'm not going to find anything, and reassure them that it's not a bed bug or a spider or a mite or whatever they think it might be, um, because they are just convinced. And some people, even if I tell them that, if I tell them it can't be bed bugs, if my technician goes and inspects and finds no bed bugs, but they still got these quote-unquote bites, they want to believe it. And so they'll keep spending money and spending time and worrying themselves into a frenzy for no really good reason. And it, it breaks my heart because there's nothing I can do for them. You know, I can't, I can't change their thinking. That's just the way they are. Yes? What do you do if your house is infested with bed bugs? It really depends on the level of infestation. An initial introduction of bed bugs can often be handled by the householder themselves. Uh, there are a multitude of ways to deal with bed bugs uh, that, that, can, that can take care of the problem. Let's say that you brought in one or two bed bugs and you happen to find it. Same scenario as what I said about the business. If you found those and killed them and you can't find any more, just wait and see. It takes a long time to go from the in initial introduction of a bed bug or two to a full-flown infestation because they go through five life stages. At each life stage, they have to take a blood meal in order to molt. When they become an adult female, after they mate it, they have to take a blood meal to lay eggs, and then I can't remember how often in between, but before, after some lays, they have to uh, take another blood meal to lay again. So you see how long it takes to go from that and generally, the bed bugs are going to be at or on the bed, at or on the couch or easy chair, because that's where their food is. They have no desire to go looking around your kitchen cabinets uh, or elsewhere, because that's where their food is. Now, they will start to move under circumstances. When the populations get too large, when their host disappears, uh, because of the very cruel type of mating practice, then females and males will run away from um, very uh, active males, and so they will go farther away, but they will always come back to feed. And so to answer your question, if, if you have an initial introduction like that, take care of what you've got and then monitor it. See if there's anything more happening. Don't be too quick to spend money. Then if the problem is larger than that, if you find, oh, there's a whole bunch of them in my bed, then you have a couple of options. Start with a good vacuuming. Vacuum thoroughly that bed, box spring, and be sure to take the fabric liner off the bottom and vacuum up in there. The box spring is one of their favorite hiding places for two reasons. One, we talked about they don't like motion. Mattresses move a whole lot more than bed bugs, excuse me, than, than box springs do. So quite often they'll go down further than the mattress to hide. They like it especially up inside the box because that's wood and it's easy for them to hang on to that wood and to stick their eggs to that wood. Now they can stick their eggs to fabric as well, but the wood is attractive to them and there's always lots of nail holes. Countersunk nail holes or screw holes are excellent hiding places. I did an inspection this afternoon at a local hotel 
and uh, the bed that they complained about, I checked it out, and all I found was two brand new nymphs. I had to really look for them. And one was in a little screw hole. The other was crawling uh, up the edge of the box spring, the very bottom. I thought, hey, they got it easy. I said, but just for sure, let me check the bed that they weren't complaining about. And that's where I found the adults. Oh my God. Wow. So, yeah, so there you do have to be careful to be thorough in your inspection. Keep in mind that the only bed bugs you see may not be the only bed bugs you have. What's considered an infestation? Infestation is really a matter of determination on the part of the person who's got it and the person who's treating it. Uh, the organization I belong to called Bed Bug Central and Bed Bug Free, which was developed by Dr. Phil Cooper and Jeff White, they have a level of 100 and 1,000. Uh, 100 is moderate, 1,000 is high for their infestation what level. All, all levels, all ages. Yeah, all ages. And so usually, by the time you're in the thousands, generally people know they've got a problem unless they're older and can't see very well or don't react to bed bugs. One of the interesting things about the rise in bed bugs, I hope I'm not taking too much time here, is the increase we saw, we mentioned, in the elderly housing area. Elderly people, their skin does not react as readily to bed bug bites. And so they may have bed bugs and never know it. In addition, they don't see as well. And if, sadly, they're the ones that don't have family come to visit them very often, nobody sees it. And so they can, they're the ones often where you'll find those huge infestations with bed bugs running up the wall, all over the curtains, uh, the mattresses and box springs just filled. I think the one document I, got, I brought to you has a picture, if I'm not mistaken, of that worst case scenario. No, I didn't bring that one. But those are the ones where you see the mattress where they're just taped on there. And that's sad. As to, what do you do when that happens? <laughs> again, depending on whether you're going to do it yourself or hire a professional, uh, I really like, on box springs and mattresses, I like to use encasements. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, that's the most expensive type of treatment for a good quality encasement. That's another area where the industry, and especially the retail industry, has gotten a little bit greedy. Same thing with the chemicals we use. The chemicals we use, especially the ones we had before, all of a sudden become twice or three times more valuable once the bed bug epidemic hit. And so we're constantly dealing with high prices and those things. Good quality encasements, you can be looking, box spring and mattress, for a king size bed in the range of about $250. But the reason I like those is they seal in not only any bed bugs that are on there, but the eggs also. If it's a well-built encasement, and by well-built, I mean that it is built of material, not of plastic, because they can stick their proboscis through plastic. It's bed bug proof on all sides, not just the top, because if you lay your arm over the side, they'll feed on the side. The zipper is small enough in link that a baby can't get through it. The zipper is secured at the end somehow to where it cannot accidentally come loose. And the fabric is strong enough to withstand a certain amount of motion. So um, the brand I use has met all of those criteria that the entomologist that developed the bed bug free program is, have chosen. And so I've chosen that as my standard as well here for the ones I do that are bed bug free as well as for what I sell in that particular uh, range. Again, because you don't have to apply a pesticide to the box spring and mattress, there are pesticides that you can. Part of the problem is people don't tend to read labels on pesticides. If it says bed bugs, that's as far as they read and they start spraying. Uh, even some professionals will do that. Not all chemicals can be sprayed on a box spring or a mattress. Some can only be sprayed on a box spring. Some can only be sprayed on the side of a mattress. So you have to make certain that where you apply it is legal according to that label that the EPA puts on it. But if we don't have to apply a pesticide and we've secured now the box spring and mattress, now you start getting a good slight, nice sleep right away. Now we back that up, and, and again, I'm plugging 
the, the program that I like the best, so please forgive me because I'm familiar with that. We back that up by treating the frame of the bed, pull it away from the wall just a little bit, and put leg protectors, the blackout, which is a better one, or the climb up. This is the uh, climb up right here. Put those under the legs of the bed because bed bugs cannot fly or jump. The only way they can now get on the bed is to the leg. They get caught in the trap and they can't get on the bed. Or if they're on the bed trying to get off, they get caught and can't spread elsewhere. We also use them under couches to keep them from spreading or getting on the couch. Excellent tools, not real expensive, um, and a, uh, again, a non-pesticide approach. Again, I had nothing wrong with pesticides. I use them. Um, but uh, everything you can do without them is to your advantage because they continue to do their job, whereas pesticides tend to break down over the course of time. From there, the edges of the carpeting in this particular program, in two of my programs, we know that bed bugs also like to hide down along the tack strip area of the carpet. And so we take and we apply a dust material down there, a pesticidal dust. And those do last for a long, long time to get those that are hiding down in there. Electrical outlets near the beds and couches are also places they love to hide. So we open them up and dust them as well. Again, that lasts a long time. You don't have to worry about shorting or anything like that. And then liquids, aerosols for everything else you're doing. Heat is another choice. Uh, heat is promoted strongly by, by some. Uh, I'll be very frank with you, I'm not a fan of it uh, for house and apartment treating. The only heat treating I do is I have a building where people bring me furniture and items. In fact, I just finished one up today where we heat it. I can control the heat. I know exactly what it's doing, and I know I'm getting 100% kill. When you get into houses and apartments here in Alaska, there are two or three things that make that a challenge. One is Alaskans use a lot of concrete in their construction. Concrete is a natural heat sink. It pulls the heat away from the surface. So you can have a bed bug sitting on the edge of the floor on the concrete behind the tack strip, and you can get that room at 140 degrees. It only takes 120 to 123 to kill them. You can get that room at 140 degrees and wait for it to penetrate everywhere to a temperature about 125 and it'll never get that hot where that bed bug is. What it will do, however, is upset that bed bug. And that bed bug will hunker down and stay there for a long time until he feels comfortable to go back and feed again, which can take 60, uh, 30 to 60 days or more before they do that. By that time, most of those types of warranties are over with, and you've got a new problem all of a sudden started because those that were missed. The second thing it does and those that do it have scientists who say it doesn't happen. There are other scientists who says it does. And I believe it does because I've seen it. It will scatter bed bugs. Especially in a multi-dwelling location, you stand a good chance of running those bed bugs into the unit next to you, above, or below you. Or, at the very least, in your own home, of running them into areas they would not normally hide. And because once the heat is gone, there's nothing left in place now to kill them when they come back out again like with pesticide application along with these other devices, now they're going to come out and feed. Other things is the structure of our homes. Some of our older homes and apartments are quite built a long time ago. They leak. And so the heat, even though they think the heat is getting hot everywhere, that heat along that outside wall is not reaching that killing temperature. So they survive. And what will happen because of our uh, older construction is uh, they have more hiding places than normal. The last thing is Alaskans are stuff people. Alaskans have more stuff than anywhere I've ever lived. <laughs> and because the bed bugs can be almost anywhere and that heat has to penetrate everywhere, it takes a long time to penetrate. Plus, with all that stuff, it takes a long time to heat up the room because the more stuff you have, the more it absorbs the heat and the longer it takes that ambient temperature to come up. And so I just really stayed away from it, and the complaints that I get about it have supported that, and they tend to be in those same areas as to why they fail. The other thing, of course, is in rural Alaska, it's very hard to get heat stuff out there. Now, we do have, uh, I have, have the privilege of sitting as an advisor on uh, a board 
uh, that's a conjoint uh, group of the Tanana Chiefs Conference and the Bristol Bay Medical, Bristol Bay, anyway, it's the medical part of the Bristol Bay uh, uh, Association. They uh, took a grant from the EPA, and over the last year we have been developing a program that will be sent out to the bush. It was released uh, in the news about a month ago on uh, the uh, APN network. We're going to be sending out things that these people in these villages can do to try to stop the problem, including they're going to be providing what they call hot boxes. Uh, in fact, I brought one. I was going to bring it in and show it to you, uh, of the one that I use for treating books. Um, but these hot boxes can be used for putting items into to treat. Or these, I think, will actually be big enough that you can put furniture in them. You actually build it over the top of the furniture, heat them up, and accomplish what I do in my building. So we're very pleased to see the progress. That's been one of the things I have been really pushing for the last 10 years is to see the Native organizations get a little bit more involved. That is, a lot of their people living on very small incomes who are dealing with this issue, and it just seemed right that they would do something to step up on behalf of their people. And it's not a criticism. It's just that sometimes things move slowly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So we're very pleased about that. Let's get back to libraries. Suppose that uh, someone comes into the library and presents with bed bugs. That's what I call it, presents with bed bugs. You see a client sitting on a chair, and you happen to see a bed bug on them. Again, no time to panic. When they leave, carefully inspect that chair. As I said, bed bugs are not hard to find. So you carefully inspect that chair. If you find a bed bug, kill it. Let Bill know if you're in the MOA system or whoever is in charge of your facilities from around the state, let whoever is in charge know what you found so they can monitor the situation going forward. They then will determine, does anything more need to be done? Uh, and if more needs to be done, then a professional or someone well-trained in, in the library system can make that determination, this is what needs to be done, and do it. No need to panic, no need to worry about the entire library. Generally, all you're worried about is that chair or that group of chairs. That's really all you're really concerned about. In books, different situation. We're going to have to be a little bit more proactive in watching the books as they're being turned in. How you're going to do that, I don't know. <laughs> other than it may require some consideration on the part of the library management systems as to what they will do to watch for those books. Obviously, if you have a client that you've received sort of things like that before, then you know to watch for that client, keep his items separate. Um, but if you see smudges, uh, blood smudges or brown smudges, set those books aside. Uh, one of the things I like that Bill and his staff does is not only they set them aside, they put them into a tight-fitting Ziploc bag to make sure nothing can escape. That way then somebody with a little more expertise can examine it carefully and see, was that just chocolate cake or was that in fact bed bugs that affected that book? Then the determination can be made, is the book salvageable or not? If the damage is sufficient by means of the blood stains or whatnot, it may be a simple matter of discarding the book. If you want to save it, then you, the simplest thing to do is heat treat it. They make little boxes, and, and that's what I did. I did four books for him that way. This one I stuck in my heat building with another people's, with other people's property. The little heat box is about this big, stands about this tall, and you can generate in a few hours enough heat to kill everything uh, that's in there. So you just take the book, lay it open. I like to go ahead and take the uh, liners completely loose to where they hang as loose as possible so that air can circulate and that will kill the bed bugs and the eggs that are in it because 121 to 123. The reason I say 121 to 123 is that number continues to change by for some reason. So I just say 121 to 123. Um, it'll kill bed bugs and eggs if it hits them. And what works better than merely hot temperature is hot temperature in motion. You see, temperature in motion with a little bit of air movement stands a better chance 
of killing a bed bug or an egg than merely raising the ambient temperature. Why that is is a little above my pay grade. <laughs> but they found that that's true. Yes? Um, in regards to um, identical, those dryers? Dryers are a great tool. Anything that you're concerned about that can be run through a dryer, put it in the dryer cycle. That will usually take care of it. You can wash it and dry it if it's uh, clothing, and that will kind of double your chances. I would not rely on washing alone, however, because water alone, and even soapy water alone, is not 100% effective against bed bugs. Now, having said that, what we have developed for some of our medical facilities around town, particularly our renal care facilities that we uh, have on contract, they get hit a lot. Constantly, they have people presenting with bed bugs. Number one, that's an environment where you don't want to be using pesticides. It's a medical environment. Number two, what do you kill? I mean, what, what do you do? How do you know where the bed bug is now? So we have trained them when they see a bed bug on a person. Uh, is they normally clean the chair afterwards anyway between clients, but go a little heavier. Go a wet spray of their sanitizer, because a sanitizer also will break down an exoskeleton of an insect. So go a little heavier on that, let it fall down in the cracks, and that's worked very well for them. Uh, they almost never have to have us come out and do anything for them. They just call us, we discuss the situation, they deal with it that way, and, and it's worked very well. So that's a solution that you can look to in, your, in, in almost any environment, is what can you find that will kill them? If you can see them, the best thing to do is, 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 is squash them. That raises another interesting question about all of the things on the market that are the next best thing to slice bread. Everybody in the world says that this particular technique or that particular material will kill bed bugs and is perfectly harmless. Be careful because a lot of that material is purely anecdotal. It may have worked for one people, two people, 50 people, and for 50 people it didn't. The other thing is almost everything that they sell is a contact chemical. One of the big ones, of course, is rubbing alcohol. Spray the walls with rubbing alcohol, okay? If rubbing alcohol hits a bed bug, it will kill it. But once it lands on the surface, it, it dries. It has no value after that. So what are you doing? What are you accomplishing? And if you can see a bed bug to spray it, you can see a bed bug to pick it up and flush it down the toilet and be 100% sure that the bed bug is gone. So do be careful of some of that stuff that's floating around out there on the good old internet, our great source of educational material that's going to make libraries go away. <laughs> Did I hit a nerve there? Not yet. <laughs> but, but yeah, that's, that, that's very true. So, so we would encourage you to, you know, just Use caution. Uh, those of you who do not have a protocol, such as MOA library system does, those of you in the bush, it may be time to develop a protocol. I know Bill here would be more than happy to share his information with you and help you develop your protocols. I just spent some of your money. Um, if you need help from me, my phone is almost always available. Uh, just honor me with the fact that if I say I'm too busy, I'm honestly too busy. Other than that, I'm free of charge as long as I'm sitting at my desk with my own cup of coffee. I don't charge anything. Okay, uh, other questions? Where did you get your tie? <laughs> this is one of the few times my wife will let me wear my bed bug tie. That is very nice. I have another one that's a butterfly tie that she sometimes makes wear. I actually got this from that company called Bed Bug Central. <laughs> For a shameless plug, on those documents I sent out to you is the website for Bed Bug Central. This site was developed by Dr. Cooper. Now, by the way, Dr. Cooper went back to Rutgers University recently and finally got his doctorate. So now he is Dr. Cooper. Nice guy. He and his brother Rick are um, um, uh, anyway. They run their father's uh, the com company his father started many years ago. Uh, called Cooper Pest Control, or Cooper Pest Solutions out in New Jersey. And he did a doctorate thesis. He wanted to do one on bed bugs canines, because there's a lot of discussion about dogs finding bed bugs. He was so disappointed with his initial results 
that he couldn't extrapolate enough material to really get a good thesis built, so he decided instead to go to a uh, monitoring uh, program in some elderly housing using devices such as this to monitor movement and uh, population patterns in elderly high-rise residences. And, because, and his thesis was good enough to win him a doctorate recently. So he, along with Jeff White, the entomologist, who was kind enough to come up a couple of years ago for us and put on a presentation, he wants to come up again, um, put together this material that you see there on Bed Bug Central. And Jeff has some videos on there. Uh, there's a site on there called Bed Bug 101, which is a class that he and, and uh, Robert DeJoseph teach all around the country for those that are dealing with, pest, uh, with bed bugs in their business. And he's got videos on there where he talks about how to handle certain situations, what things work, what things don't work. Very straightforward videos. Uh, there's a place where you can buy materials as well uh, if you're looking to buy something from a source that's reputable. Obviously, it's a commercial site. You know, they make the money that way. But they're more than happy to share their knowledge. Uh, they are both frequent speakers at the bed bug summits, other bed bug classes. They are both frequently called as expert witnesses in court cases. Um, they speak, both of them, at the National Pest Management Association annually, as well as at other functions. So they're very knowledgeable people. And they do not mind taking questions. If you have a question, you can post it there. And they'll be more than happy to help you with that. I have consulted with him on the library situation. We actually tried something that didn't work. Uh, we tried to use a packet that was developed at Rutgers University by Dr. Chow, which is an attractant that attracts bed bugs, and we took and we stapled a bunch of glue boards to the bottom of some chairs here, put a packet on it, see if we could attract bed bugs to it. It didn't work. And the reason I found out it didn't work was that the next summit they says, oh, glue traps don't work because they walk on their tarsals and they don't stick to them. I said, I wish you told me that before I got Bill so excited. <laughs> <laughs> so we're always learning together. And I consulted with both of them on the library issue some time ago, and they're very helpful. And you, somebody had their hand up. Was it, oh, yes. So bed bugs don't have anything to do with personal hygiene or household hygiene. They're just hitchhikers that yes. are opportunistic. Yes. So obviously education is a big part of this. Is there, in, in your particular field, any that we could get ahead of this again like we were before the 2000s? You know, we, we have really discussed that. They call it in our industry the silver bullet. And they're always looking for it. I saw some promising information two years ago from a research scientist who was experimenting with a, um, a mold uh, that was developed to fight African locust. And they found it works very well against bed bugs, too. The problem was the time be between finding out it works to developing something the EPA accepts is long. And they're also failing, facing that other hurdle is the thought that somebody would say, you're going to put what in my house? <laughs> that was the last really good thing I saw. And, and I don't think it's really short on the horizon at this point. They are always playing with different chemical techniques, different approaches. Uh, they tried the cold treatment. And I was privileged to share some of the experiments we had done many years ago on putting furniture out at 40 below zero. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Uh, the only way that cold can kill a bed bug is if you hit it with sub-zero temperatures quickly. If you take a bed bug by itself, put it in the freezer, it will die. If you take a bed bug, put it in a refrigerator freezer, and then turn it on and let the temperature come up to freezing, it will lower its temperature ability and survive. So outside what happens, and, and this we see this all the time. People say, well, I put it outside in the cold and brought it back in. Yeah, and what happened? They woke up. The reason for that is twofold. One, the ambient temperature outside at 40 below on the thermometer is not the same temperature as the surface of that couch or chair. You've got air temperature and you've got surface temperature and they measure differently. 
The second thing is the bed bugs are very civil on the surface anyway. They're down inside. What do we teach our kids when they get lost out in the middle of winter? Build a snow hut, right? Freezing snow keeps them warm. So they, they're down inside the comfort of that couch or chair. They don't hit that freezing temperature, and they survive just fine. So it just is not, unfortunately. They have some places do use a cryogenic process, but it's very cumbersome. The tool they use is hard to use. It doesn't travel very far, and so they don't get it where the bed bugs are at. We found the same thing to do with steam. Steam for a long time was a big concept that we used a lot. We found the same thing with that. Steam only travels so far. And so uh, it's not used near as much in the industry as it once was. Steaming surfaces is going to be of little value unless there's bed bugs on that surface. A good vacuum with a, a crack and crevice tool, one of your best tools. Get it down inside that couch, inside that bed, along the edge of that carpeting. Vacuum up as many as you can, and don't forget to throw that bag away <laughs> or put the vacuum outside until you can't get rid of it. Those are some of your best tools. It's just reasoning power. What can I do to, number one, reduce this infestation? Because that's what we've come to now. In a lot of our situations, and that's where we went with this new program that uh, the state, uh, that the uh, two uh, um, native authorities are putting on, is they have gotten away from bed bug elimination to bed bug control. All you can do is control the amount of activity. You probably will not be able to eliminate it. They have some unique features in those villages that are just beyond belief compared to city dwelling. Um, I have for a long time preached against treating schools for bed bugs um, because of the same thing I mentioned in regard to um, the problem in the business. And they sleep in the schools out there, so they're getting bed bugs. Okay, I guess we need to close. I appreciate very much the opportunity to speak. My phone is always available. My phone number is on those documents. If you want to call me, I'd be more than happy to answer questions and be of whatever sense I can to anybody that has a problem on any pest issue. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs>